From 1981 to 1985, NASCAR hosted a consolation race for drivers who failed to qualify for the Daytona 500. It was an opportunity for these drivers to walk away with a trophy or some money, even though they missed out on the big show. The one thing you did not want to do was wreck your car at high speeds when you're competing for a measly few thousand dollars. However, just 10 laps into the 1984 event, a scary and horrific crash broke out between drivers Jim Hurlbert and Nats Peters. Right before we get into the video, make sure you leave a like if you enjoy, it really helps me out a lot. Also, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already so you never miss a video. Anyway, let's get right into it. In addition to the five true consolation races held from 1981 to 1985, there were also consolations held from 1959 to 1962. But these were more like last chance qualifiers. Drivers were able to race their way into the Daytona 500 through these races. But from 1981 to 85, after drivers failed to qualify for the big show, they had an option to compete in a short 30 lap sprint just a handful of days before the 500 for some prize money. Of course, it was not ideal to be in the race. The prize pool was pretty underwhelming, so it's obvious as to why some drivers opted not to participate in the race at all. Other drivers with sponsors would most likely participate to get some exposure. The winner of the 1984 consolation race would be awarded with just $3,500, whereas the last place finisher in the Daytona 500 in the same year would rack up over fourteen grand. The 1984 consolation race was the day after the twin 125 qualifying races that set the field for the Daytona 500. So before we get into the consolation race, let's recap some moments from the twin 125s. Notable veteran of 18 years and over 400 races, JD McDuffie could not race his way into the 500 and would participate in the consolation race. Rookie Randy LaJoy also missed out on the 500 because of this massive wreck. It was the second big crash of Speed Weeks, coming after Rudd's bad bush clash wreck in the exact same spot. Due to injury and a badly damaged car, Randy would not start the consolation race. Defending Indy 500 champ Tom Sneva also failed to qualify for the 500 after hitting the wall. I heard something snap in the back, and the next thing I knew I was headed toward the wall. I'm afraid the car is too badly damaged to make the consolation race Friday and this turned out to be true as he was unable to participate in the race. Another notable driver who missed the 500 was Jack Ingram. The 1984 Daytona 500 was his last attempt at a Cup Series start, but the driver would go on to win 31 races and two championships in just six seasons of Xfinity Series competition. However, he would also abstain from competing in the consolation race. Now, let's get to it. The consolation field was led by Ramo Stott and J.D. McDuffie. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any footage of the race, except a horrifying crash on lap 10. The exit of turn 4 saw its third big crash of the weekend. Nats Peters followed J.D. McDuffie's Pontiac when he lost control of his car. He slid to the inside and smacked the inside wall with the rear of his car. The inside wall was just a guardrail that reinforced the dirt embankment, which shot Peter's car back up on the track directly in front of Jim Hurlbert, who did not even let off the throttle and made hard contact. The pair of cars were engulfed with flames as the fuel cell of the 60 machine exploded. Peters escaped the fireball that was his car, but collapsed as soon as he jumped out. Rescuers had to work quickly to extract Jim from his mangled vehicle after it slid for more than 100 yards against the outside wall. Miraculously, both drivers survived, but both were sent to the hospital. Although Peters escaped with some facial burns and a minor pelvis injury, it was Jim who suffered more. Following the crash, he was in surgery for more than five hours after suffering first degree and second degree burns on his face and arms, bad face lacerations, broken teeth, a broken jaw, and a severely fractured right ankle. The five hour surgery included repairing his ankle and facial reconstruction. Luckily, the impact was to the rear of Peter's car, rather than the driver's side door, which could have easily been the case. This explains Peter's minor injuries. On the flip side, Hurlbert's cockpit was mangled in the impact, trapping him inside of the car and causing major injury. The heat from the fire was so great that photographers on the roof of the grandstand felt their eyebrows cinch. Joe Brewer, who clipped Peter's car after it stopped spinning, 
stated, I have never seen so much fire in my life. The track looked like a big large sun. I could just see smoke and dust. I drove right through the ball of fire. He went on to add that his car began to slide after he drove through the flames, resulting in his impact on Peters. After a 30 minute red flag, the green flag was back out. There were a couple more cautions, but in the end, it was Connie Saylor who ended up taking the checkered flag and collected the $3,500 check for winning. During the Florida 200 the same day, a fireman stationed on Pitt Road was injured when Lou Horton's car spun out on the exit of turn 4. His car slid backwards on Pitt Road and struck the fireman. The fireman, identified as 23-year-old Ken Morgan, suffered a leg injury but was released from the hospital the same day. Things didn't get much better in the sportsman race the next day. The crew chief of Neil Bonnet's car for the sportsman race, Doug Richard, was changing tires for Bonnet's car when he was struck on pit road by L.D. Ottinger. Richard was launched into the air and then he was hospitalized. The injury sidelined him for nearly three months. So heading into the 1984 Daytona 500, the Cup Series stars were growing angry with NASCAR after the multitude of accidents. Nearly half a dozen people were injured during speed weeks, with few of them narrowly escaping death. Darrell Waltrip was outspoken with his concerns and had a very interesting proposal. I'm insisting that we use the chicane, said Waltrip, referencing the backstretch chicane at the track. We're going to see cars going through the Goodyear building if something is not done about this situation. You've got no room to slow down before you hit the wall. And then the wall turns you back out onto the racetrack. I ain't the smartest guy in the world, but how many wrecks are we going to have before something is done about it? Surely to God, someone will see that there's a problem and do something. After having three major incidents, Turn 4 was labeled Calamity Corner for the 1984 Speed Weeks. Another infamous term used during the Speed Weeks was the bump. This referenced the bump, well, an indention in the track in the exit of Turn 4. Drivers would hit the bump, which sent their cars to the right, and their immediate response was to turn the wheel to the left. Sometimes they would turn too much to the left, sending their car into a spin, heading toward the dangerous inside wall. According to Darrell Waltrip, the bump was the cause for all three major accidents. Waltrip also stated that the surface was slicker than in years prior and speeds were much faster. Waltrip had a lot more to say, basically going on to state that there were multiple flaws with the track design. To this, Bill France Jr., the president of NASCAR, stated, No comment. A fear held by Waltrip and other drivers was literally ramping the dirt embankment on the inside and flying into the infield. Before the 500, the inside wall was reinforced to stop cars from flying into the infield. And remember Waltrip's comments about cars flying into the Goodyear building? Well, they actually reinforced the Goodyear tire shop just in case. However, the changes to the inside wall only made it more likely that cars would hit the wall then deflect back onto the track. After the Daytona 500, in response to the concerns of safety, Daytona made some changes before the July race. The inside wall, which was a dirt embankment reinforced by a guardrail, was replaced by another wall that was actually parallel to the track and 30 feet farther back. The new wall was 8 feet tall, with dirt piled up behind it, followed by a secondary wall. Further, the grass was paved over, hopefully slowing cars down and keeping them on the ground. These were actually some very good changes by the track. Despite these changes, nothing was done about the bump. And that was because none of the track officials could even prove that the bump was real. The Speedway Director of Public Relations stated that there is no bump and that it only exists in the imaginations of the drivers. He suggested that the cars would bottom out, and that's what caused the poor handling of the cars in the exit of Turn 4. Not a bump. The drivers were not happy with that response if you could imagine. Before the July Daytona race, the Daytona Beach News came out with an article detailing Jim Hurlburt's recovery. Although he was in a wheelchair at the time, and still had a few surgeries before he could walk normally again, he was in good spirits. He even made jokes about his ankle and leg that was destroyed in the wreck. During his time in the hospital, it was hard, but he always kept a cheerful attitude. He was not able to work in his home improvement business, which was barely surviving in his absence. At the time, it was a big question, would Jim ever be able to race again? 
So although Jim never raced in the Cup Series again, he was able to get back behind the wheel of an ARCA car the very next year in 1985. Jim would attempt to qualify for the ARCA race at Daytona seven times in the next decade, but would never make the field. After a crash that nearly ended his racing career, business, and life, he could never get his redemption at Daytona by racing another race at the track. Alright guys, that's it for this video. I hope you did enjoy. If you did, make sure you leave a like and subscribe if you are new. Anyway, that's it for this video. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.